today it is possible for you, whatever your circumstances or life, however well or badly you think you have been doing, to be at home, deeply at home in the fellowship of your Father. As you and I learn together the secret of the easy yoke of Jesus, how we might grow towards effortlessly doing the things that Jesus would do by arranging our life around those activities, practices, rhythms that Jesus himself engaged in so that he might be constantly at home with and receiving power from his loving Heavenly Father. And of course, if we trust Jesus, we trust he knew how to live. And if he needed to arrange his life around those kinds of practices, solitude and silence and uh, celebration and worship and prayer, then of course, it probably might be helpful for you and me who are not the Son of God to try as well. And today, I want to talk about a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful practice. It's an old, old word, fellowship. This is a practice of engagement. So this is something that we do in fellowship. Dallas Willard writes, this is page 186 of the Spirit of the Disciplines. In fellowship, we engage in common activities of worship, study, prayer, celebration, and service with other disciples. This may involve assembling ourselves together in a large group or meeting with only a few. So it's quite simple. We take activities that we have already discussed somewhat to this point, only now we do those activities together with other people who are brothers and sisters of the faith. That is fellowship. Why would we want to do that? This is a deep observation about the nature of the soul and spiritual life. I don't know why it is true. I just know that it is true. Personalities united can contain more of God and sustain the force of his greater presence much better than scattered individuals. Let me read that again. Personalities united can contain much more of God and sustain the force of his greater presence much better than scattered individuals. The fire of God kindles higher as the brands are heaped together and each is warmed by the other's flame. The members of the body must be in contact if they are to sustain and be sustained by each other. Christian redemption is not devised to be a solitary thing, although each individual, of course, has a unique and direct relationship with God. And God alone is her or his Lord and judge. But the life, the life, is one that requires some regular and profound conjunction with others who share it. It is greatly diminished when that is lacking. It is almost precisely like if you have um, a charcoal fire, if you're grilling something, you just take one of those little lumps of charcoal and put it off to the side, and pretty soon it will run out of fire and grow cold just by being isolated from those other little briquettes. You are a little briquette, and you need other briquettes. I don't know why it is that this is so, but I know that it is so. Together we contain more of God than we do separately, and so we engage in fellowship. Now, one of the problems with the word fellowship, it has just become a cliche. I don't know why, for some reason, I grew up in the Baptist church. I'm very grateful for it. I love that. Baptist churches tend to have a fellowship hall. We go to fellowship hall for receptions, and it would generally involve red punch and cookies and then trying to make small talk. I'm an introvert. Making small talk is painful for me. And... uh, The experience in the fellowship hall was rarely actually fellowship. Presbyterian churches have a fireside room. I don't know why, they just do. Uh, In fellowship, as it is understood biblically, we are together with people in a great common cause. If you've ever read Tolkien, the fellowship of the ring, a band of people who are on a noble quest and draw strength from each other as they serve and talk and encourage, that's a sense of fellowship. One of the first dates that I went on with Nancy, we went to see an old movie called The Night of the Hunter. Robert Mitchum plays this psychopathic minister, kind of a scary thought. And he was after these little children to get money and they knew where it was. And he would sing this old hymn, What a fellowship 
And it was a really scary movie. I called Nancy that up. That was early in our relationship, about two o'clock in the morning. She could pick up the phone and I just started singing, what a fellowship. It was very scary for her. Scaring Nancy is one of the things I love to do. I snuck up on her in a car yesterday, pounded on the window. She let out a scream. I wish I had videoed, but I digress. Fellowship is not a cliche. In that old movie, uh, there is a character portrayed then by an old woman, Lillian Gish, who watches out for these children, who cares for them, who sings to them, who encourages them. That's the fellowship. And we are to engage in that with each other. Fellowship is not just hanging out with people. Sometimes in churches, you might hear people use that word in kind of a cliched way. We were just hanging out. We fellowship together. Now, if you will notice what Dallas writes here, in fellowship, it's quite a particular thing. We are engaging in these certain activities, but we're doing that with other believers so that we can contain more of God as we are together. And this is the nature of the structure of the soul. In Alcoholics Anonymous, as you might know, there is a saying, I get drunk, we get sober. We are able to experience the power to be healed when we gather together. I will often go to small groups uh, that are 12-step groups in AA, and it's a strange thing. We will read some from the big book. People will tell the story of how they are being given strength for life. And I'll walk out of there with my compass needle pointing north again. That's a picture of fellowship. In the big book, it actually says we need two things. The big book of A. We need a program. Okay, the program, that's what we're doing right now. Each day, we want to follow that golden triangle, be experiencing the presence of the Holy Spirit, find God in our circumstances, especially trials and tribulations, and then arrange our life around certain practices. That is the program. It's not rocket science. You are doing that. Way to go. Keep going. We need a program, but then we need a fellowship. We need to gather together with other people. So it is a fundamental need. Here's how you can do it today. It's just very simple kind of miniature versions, little mini fellowship. Read a passage of scripture with another person. And you might just talk as you go through that. Uh, here's where I find something helpful to me. Here's an encouraging word. Might be just a single word, hope or love or joy. There's something about reading scripture together. There's a whole kind of movement right now. It's going on in the U.S., I think Korea, other places called Just Show Up, where people will gather together for an hour in an office room or someplace and simply read the scripture together out loud. That's fellowship. Um, uh, Today, pray with somebody. I actually, right before this, was with Tim Williams and our little crew, five folks joining each other by Zoom, and we pray together. Something happens when we pray with others. My best friends, one of my best friends in the world is somebody who will struggle a lot with doubt and sometimes just be on the razor's edge. I don't know if I believe if there's God or not. And I remember saying to him one time, well, why don't you try being an atheist for a while? And he just laughs laughs like, you know, I can't do that. I'm filled with doubts, but I can't do that. Several years ago, when I was going through a really, really, really hard time, I said to my friend, I'll tell you something, um, for this next season of life, you don't get to be an atheist because I have to have you praying. I can't pray right now in the way that I need prayer, but you can do that. So uh, you do not have the luxury for this next period of time of being an atheist. The day will come someday when you can, but not today. And he said, okay. And he prayed for me, and we would pray together. And like that little lump of charcoal, like that little briquette, I got to be in a little pile of people where the fire was kept alive inside me in ways that I promised to you I could not keep it alive for myself. It's just a real deep thing. Um, Today, go and serve someone with another person. Work is an opportunity for fellowship in the discipline of service. Today, Worship with another person. I came across this old hymn in a statement that I read from Dallas. The hymn is, Come Ye Disconsolate. Now, uh, 
To be consoled when we're going through something difficult is a wonderful thing. To be disconsolate is to be unable to find any consolation. And Jesus says in these words, if you can't find consolation anyplace else, then you come to me, all you who languish, here at the mercy seat, fervently kneel. Tell him your broken heart. Speak of your anguish. Earth has no sorrow that... and. I played a version of that song for Nance. We just listened to those words together and I found consolation listening to that together with her that I couldn't find otherwise. Celebrate with somebody. That's Babette's feast. Go someplace and eat food you love to eat and drink food that you love to drink with another person, a group of people that you love to be with. And that is fellowship all through the day, just in little moments, you can have fellowship. And if that's not your deal, got another one tomorrow. Welcome home. Hey, I'm Tim. Thanks for joining us here at Become New. We hope that these videos help you to grow spiritually one day at a time. If you want to access our whole library of videos, or if you want to subscribe to the daily emails or text messages that go along with each video, head on over to becomenew.com and you can let us know there. We're also preparing some exclusive leadership content. So if you're interested in that, you can let us know at becomenew.com slash leadership. And lastly, if you've got a prayer request, we would love to pray for you. You can let us know by texting it to 855-888-0444. See you next time.